For as long as we've been watching Mars, the planet's been playing tricks on human eyes. Turn the clock back now, oh, a mere 60,000 years. We see the red planet as the ancient nomadic Neanderthal families of Europe might have seen it. As Mars draws closer to Earth than it will again until August of 2003. Mars will confuse and confound our Earthbound attempts to understand it for the next 600 centuries. You see, the motion of Mars night after night seems a little tipsy. Of all the easily seen planets, it's the only one that bobs, bops, and backtracks. It'll take the loopy logic of the Egyptian astronomer Ptolemy to devise a credible explanation. His solution? A great system of circles within circles called epicycles. And Earth, of course, is at the center. And no one will come up with a provably better idea for nearly 14 centuries. Until Nikolaj Kopernik, a.k.a. Copernicus of Poland. Copernicus argues if you put the sun at the center and you realize that farther planets revolve more slowly, then, among other things, the orbit of Mars now makes simple, circular sense. Well, it almost does. Mars, of course, has another trick up its sleeve. Danish astronomer and all-round passionate guy Tycho Brahe is having trouble swallowing this sun-centered, human-diminishing, God-challenging universe proposed by Copernicus. And Tycho finds a measure of comfort in making huge numbers of very precise measurements of the changing positions of Mars. But the data is baffling to Tycho. The amber world's orbit cannot possibly be a simple, perfect, sun-centered circle after all. And it falls to Tycho's research assistant, poor, diligent, underpaid, intensely religious Johannes Kepler, to figure it out. Kepler spends more than two decades in what he calls his War with Mars, bashing his head against the perfect spherical geometry of human assumptions about God's creation, until he finally realizes that Mars' orbit is elliptical, not circular, and probably so is every other planet's. Working at about the same time across the mountains in Italy with his new telescope, Galileo Galilei reports that Mars seems to grow about four times bigger at particular points in its orbit. Galileo's also afraid that he's seeing a Mars that isn't round. Maybe it has phases, like Venus, he thinks. But Galileo's telescope isn't powerful enough to see much in the way of features on the planet's surface. And neither is Francisco Fontana's. In 1636, Fontana makes the first known drawing of Mars, which he calls a black pill. But the pill is probably just an aberration in Fontana's optics. For a better view, we must wait for the Huygens brothers of Holland, monster hot rodders of 17th century telescopes. And specifically, brother Christian Huygens, who, during October and November of 1659, makes the first sketches of irregular markings on Mars. He says it looks like a big bog. What he's actually found is the Sirtis Major region riding astride Mars' equator. Later, others will call this the Hourglass Sea. By watching it go round for a few nights, Huygens guesses that the Martian day must be about the same as an Earth day. Seven years later, the French astronomer Gian Domenico Cassini and his team will refine that figure to 24 hours plus about 40 minutes, startlingly close to the truth. Cassini also observes the enigmatic feature that in time will mark Earth and Mars as close siblings, the South Polar Cap. And on August 13th of 1672, Huygens draws that white beanie that Cassini has seen. But neither Cassini nor Huygens have guessed the true nature of what they're looking at. That mystery begins to be solved by Cassini's nephew and assistant, Giacomo Filippo Moraldi, in 1704. Maraldi speculates that the dark band around each of the poles, white spots as he calls them, might be seasonal melt. But he won't go so far as to say that the polar caps are definitely ice or snow. Fifteen years later, Mars comes tantalizingly close, as near as it will be again until the grand opposition of 2003. And Maraldi inches just a bit closer to calling the poles ice caps. But it'll be 65 years before anyone will say for sure. In 1784, Friedrich Wilhelm Herschel, working in England, and already famous as the discoverer of planet Uranus, declares definitively that Mars' poles are capped by water ice. And he thinks the large dark patches on the planet are oceans. 
Herschel also sees a thin but definite atmosphere, with occasionally changing bright belts, and once a dark one, that he interprets as bands of clouds floating above a stable, unchanging landscape. And this leads him to conclude that those who dwell there, quote, probably enjoy a situation in many respects similar to our own. The specter of Herschel's changing, tenuous atmosphere at Mars is inhaled by Johann Hieronymus Schroeder, musician, magistrate, and rabid amateur astronomer. And Mars the trickster has her way with him, too. Schroeder sees radical changes over time, beguiling him to believe he is seeing no solid surface at all, just the constant change of clouds around the middle latitudes and the dazzle of misty precipitation at the poles. In truth, what he's drawn may well be phenomena of the air, but it is the unstable air layers of Earth, or the effect of the night air on human perception, and maybe, just maybe, some of the airborne dust of Mars that is making Schrader's Mars transform before his eyes. The first reliable Mars maps appear in 1831, drawn by astronomer Johann Heinrich Madler and his patron Wilhelm Beer, a banker at Beer's private observatory. They choose a feature known today as Sinus Meridiani to be their line of zero longitude, and incidentally, it is to a site along Mars Prime Meridian that one of the 2004 Mars Exploration Rovers has been sent. By 1854, Mars has become a place and is capturing imaginations far beyond the observatory. William Whewell, philosopher and originator of the English word scientist, speculates poetically upon orange landscapes and dark green seas as homes for creatures. Four years later, this seductive, viral notion of habitable planets has penetrated close to the heart of the Vatican. Father Pietro Angelo Secchi, head of the Roman College Observatory, believes that God must have created innumerable extraterrestrials. Secchi begins to craft charts of Mars, and he renames our old friend the Hourglass Sea. He now calls it the Atlantic Canale. The word means channel in Italian. And in just a few months, a huge new channel, made by intelligent beings, begins to appear on Earth, the Suez Canal. Halfway through the canal's construction, British astronomer William Dawes renders several precise views of Mars, some of which make note of straight channels. These drawings, now made into a map, are promptly popularized through the media of the day by science writer Richard Anthony Proctor. Away from the telescope, Dawes is extraordinarily nearsighted, Yet, this seems only to help him achieve a level of detail never before realized for Mars. News of the completion of the Suez Canal now flows round planet Earth, wooing its inhabitants with dreams of engineering grandeur. And if we can make such big changes to our world, why not the people of Mars to theirs? And so it is that when Mars again approaches Earth in the summer of 1877, anyone with access to a telescope feels the lure of wonder about this apparent brother planet across the sky. Hypnotized by the ochre orb floating above his home on the island of Madeira, portrait artist and amateur astronomer Nathaniel Green makes painterly studies of surface details. Green compiles these, making a Mars map that is notably free of guesses or explanations, a true work of observation. And Mars has also mesmerized a self-educated American son of poverty, Asaph Hall, who is first to detect near the oncoming Mars its two tiny moons. And when, on September 5th, the planet spins within 35 million miles, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli sets his sights on making his own map of Mars. Like Dawes, Schiaparelli is remarkably nearsighted, and he's also severely colorblind. Yet his fastidious observations of Mars outdo all others. And Schiaparelli is a respected theorist, having previously proven the bond between meteor showers and periodic comets. Thus, when he freely uses Secchi's term canali to describe the lines and straight smudges he sees on Mars' surface, Schiaparelli unwittingly spawns an entire new mythology. Because he sees so many new features, Schiaparelli decides he needs a new way to name them. Long a scholar of ancient Greek and Christian literature, he chooses poetic, dreamy, legendary names. And by this choice, Schiaparelli effectively recasts Mars as an enthralling globe of enchantment. In two years' time, the planets dance close again, and the mischievous essence of Mars has a new illusion in store for Schiaparelli. He thinks he sees pairs of canali 
running in straight, parallel lines. Now, never does he say he believes any markings on Mars to be anything other than natural geology. And never does he intend his naming of seas and rivers on the ginger-tinted planet to be anything other than colorful analogies. But with Schiaparelli's Mars, the stage is now set for nearly a century of wild, pseudoscientific imaginings about intelligent Martians. Camille Flammarion, Percival Lowell, and many other astronomers will fall victim to the spell. And the glorious science fiction of H.G. Wells, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and several generations of Earthbound Martian writers will play untamed by fact to a worldwide public that desperately wants not to be all alone in the universe. From this moment until well into the space age, the ever playful Mars will entice the people of Earth down two divergent roadways. There will be those who seek to see Mars as it truly is in greater and greater detail, and those who wish it to be something more, something with a mythic history, something perhaps more easily felt than understood. But in a few brilliant minds, like Schiaparelli's, both yearnings can be held and balanced, each driving the other. And it will be from those remarkable scientific humanitarians that the greatest knowledge of Mars will eventually come.